Brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to travel this day with me with the position Luke. Out of the four Gospels we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke is the only one that writes with the medical imagination. All woven throughout the Gospel are stories of healing, Jesus encountering sickness on every hand, if you will. And in this eighth chapter in particular, we find Jesus in a crowd surrounded by many people and Luke invokes emergency room type medicine with Jairus who comes running to him, Lord, you have to heal my daughter. So then there's a pediatric issue as a 12 year old girl struggling and fighting for her life. Jairus makes clear to Jesus that you don't even have to go there. I believe you can do it from here. I, I believe that if you say the word, she'll be healed. It's, it was his last resort. And while they're having this conversation, there is a slight interruption. Jesus asked the question, who touched me? Now the disciples were a little confused about his question, as they often were. And they said to him, Lord, look at all of these people out here. How could you ask who touched you? We're all getting touched. We are stuck together here like sardines in a can. We're all getting touched. Everybody's bumping up against us. But Jesus knew that there was a different kind of touch. Apparently, power left him with this touch and was transferred to somebody who, who touched me. So Luke then points us to a gynecological form of inquiry. Now, this is an interesting thing. I will admit to you that women have not always had an easy time in the biblical narrative. They were not always treated well. For example, there was a woman being stoned for adultery. And um, the community gathered, as was the custom, to stone her. How, how dare her break up a family? The, the problem was that she was there by herself. Unless, of course, there is a way to commit adultery as a solo act, <laughs> which is not really possible, seemingly. But it was the woman who would bear the scar of public sin, while the man was able to hide behind closed doors. Let me move along. <laughs> so from time to time, uh, women did not get a fair deal. For example, if a young family or an older family could never bear children, it was always something wrong with the woman. Nobody ever thought that it might be the man who was incapacitated to participate fully in the reproductive process. It was always the woman's fault. She would bear this. And additionally, it was a result of sin that women could not bear children. Even 
The menstrual cycle was a product of great banishment for women. It's interesting that in Leviticus 15, and you've got to be careful about reading Leviticus. It's one of those books that everybody takes the scripture and throws at people. Because Leviticus is pretty real about who shouldn't do this and who shouldn't do that. And let me tell you, Leviticus is so thorough and prolific that we all fall in that category somewhere. For example, according to Leviticus, did you know that it was a little on the sinful side to eat bacon? And since all of you all are not worried about that, it really doesn't matter, but there are some, that's a real issue. <laughs> yeah, for example, it's in Leviticus where men are not to get the haircut that today we call temper fades. You're not supposed to shave your hair in a certain type of way. Let me tell you, Leviticus has something for everybody. But what it also has in the 15th chapter that a woman, during her cycle, was filthy. Not to be included in community, to, to be isolated somehow. And on top of this, you're not supposed to even touch her. And to do so, will make you filthy. It's, it's, a, it's a tough pill to swallow to think of someone being considered filthy because of their human mechanism. And here we find a woman who clearly could not help it she bled for 12 years. She had this hemorrhage, which means for 12 years, in addition to this, she was alone and isolated and by herself, could not enjoy the company of her husband and friends and family and children. It's it's got to be a rough thing to go through 12 years feeling unworthy. The community you live in considers you filthy. She tried everything. And what's interesting is there were some remedies for this kind of situation. And some of y'all know that there are a whole bunch of remedies. For example, if you all get sick nowadays, you probably go online and you find a remedy for your ailment. It's a dangerous thing. All through the years, there have been remedies for all kinds of stuff. Someone's having a stroke. Well, go eat an apple. It might, it might help you a little. Remedies. When I was a little boy, I had this illness called the Hong Kong flu. It was an epidemic going around in D.C., and we couldn't get the temperature, my temperature down. And so there was a nurse who told my mother, listen, um, you, you called, and I, I, I missed your call. What's going on? And my mother said that Kevin's pediatrician says, if you can't get the temperature down, we're going to have to put him in a hospital. And I'm told my mother was crying, and the nurse said, listen, don't worry about that. What you do is you take an onion, and you slice up that onion, and you wrap it up in cheesecloth, and you wrap his body with it. And I remember my mother doing that. And I remember telling her, but mommy, I don't like onions. And she says, well, you don't have to eat them. It's, a, it's an amazing thing how some of the things we don't like become a source of our healing. Amen. She wrapped my body and those onions cooked on my body. The aroma of them permeated the house and 
and my fever broke. <laughs> Remedies. There were some for women in this condition. I'll read you some if you don't believe me. So it was written years ago in ancient writing that if you take of gum Alexandria, of alum and of Corcus Hortensis, the weight of a zuzi each, let them be bruised together and given in wine to the woman that hath an issue of blood. Take it all away. But if this fails, take a Persian onion's nine logs, boil them in wine, and give it to her to drink, and say, arise from thy flux. You have to say, arise from thy flux. But if this should fail, set her in a place where two ways meet, and let her hold the cup of wine in her hand, and let somebody come from behind and affright her. You gotta, you gotta catch her off guard and scare her, and say, arise from thy flux. And you gotta say it, arise from thy flux. And if this doesn't work, then in the words of my grandmother, I don't know what y'all can do. <laughs> but she knew. She knew. She heard that a master healer was coming through town. She heard that this one could heal anything. But she knew that she really shouldn't be in community. She shouldn't be around people. So to avoid contaminating the Messiah, she doesn't touch him. H-I-M, she touches H-E-M. She touches the hem. <laughs> Woo, I'm sorry, I get it. All right, she touches the hem of his garment. To avoid contaminating the Lord, she, she touches the hem of his garment. She, she feels that there is definitely enough in the train of his clothes, the, the, the bottom of his garment, of, of his outfit. If I could just touch that, then something deep down within me should come to life. And, and it did, it worked. Her, her hemorrhaging stopped instantly and, and she became a brand new woman. And this is when Jesus says, I love this. Now you gotta read Luke very carefully here, or you'll miss it. Jesus does not say, who touched my clothes? And he does not say, who touches my garment? He says, who touched me? Because with Jesus, touching him is not just a physical act but it is a spiritual transfer. And her little bit of faith was counteracted by all faith, and she was made well. And he turned around, in other words, what just happened here? What, what was this occurrence? Uh, I felt power escape me. Who was it that has been healed? And she, feeling a little embarrassed, finally emerges from the crowd. Now keep in mind, this is in the middle of a crisis as it stands. Jairus is trying to get his daughter healed, and this woman interrupts Jairus' plea for his daughter with one simple touch. You have to be bold about getting your healing. You can't be polite with this thing. You have to be consistent and persistent and determined that before the Lord leaves, he's gonna bless me today. 
Before he gets out of my eyesight, he's going to anoint me today. Before he gets beyond, I am not leaving this place until the Lord blesses me, until he touches me. And I, if I've got to stay all day and all night, I, I will, but I'm not moving until the Lord blesses me. This is what you got to have even when you come to worship and when you come to church, you got to come determined that by the time the benediction is given, I'm going to encounter him some way or somehow. He won't be rolling up out of here before I get touched this morning. Oh God, you can't be polite and cute in church. You've got to know why you've come and you've got to come and do the work of dealing with yourself, dealing with your infirmities, dealing with your past, dealing with your guilt, dealing with your junk, dealing with your past. You don't come here to shook and job. You come here to get changed and transformed. Don't play with this thing. This thing is business. I, I'm glad to see you, but I'm not here to just trade coupons. I'm here to get blessed while I can. And I'm not a cliche kind of preacher. In fact, I hate cliches. Cliches drive me crazy, but I, there's, a, there's a question that's been circling around the religious community and the pulpit. And I'm going to bring this question for us. And the question is simply, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he change it? Won't he fix it? Won't he heal it? Won't he touch it? Won't he resurrect it? Won't he rebuild it? Won't he renew it? Won't he redesign it? Won't he reshift it? Won't he adjust it? Won't he change it to your favor? Won't he do it? Then you ought to stand up and say, yes, yes, he will do it every time. He may not come when I want him. But he's always on time. All right, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I didn't mean to get excited at that point. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get excited. Something deep within that woman changed. And she left having been touched by God. She thought she did the touching. But it was Christ who did the touching. It was Christ who did the healing but she had enough strength. And you don't need a whole lot. You just need a little bit to get to the hem of his garment and be made well. Now, it's interesting, very interesting. The little girl was 12 years old. This woman has been carrying this disease for 12 years. One of those remedies said, if you gotta put her where two places meet. <laughs> you, you gotta put her where two places meet and throw her off and scare her a little bit. And she had been carrying this thing for so long that when she got healed, it scared her a little bit that she backed up in the crowd. And the reason why Jesus wanted to know where she was is because he wanted her to know that you didn't steal from me, but I gave you this healing in the middle of the intersection. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, when you get in the middle of a crisis and when you get in the middle of a situation, that's the perfect time for healing to emerge. So celebrate your middle spaces and don't worry about it because God is at work when you are in the thick of it, when you are in the middle of it, when you are tired of it, when you are frustrated with it, when you have no more energy to go along with it. You better learn to trust in your middle spaces and know that the Lord of life will step out of what he's doing. He will interrupt whatever he's doing and come to your aid and touch you where you are and fix you where you are. We used to sing it like this, shackled by 
a heavy burden beneath the load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me and I am no longer the same. He touched me and made me whole. He touched me and made me whole. He touched me and gave me a new walk. He touched me and gave me a new talk. He touched me and may, may the Lord find himself being interrupted. When the Lord is keeping the sun at just enough distance from burning us to extinction. Go ahead, interrupt him. When the Lord is walking on water, calming the storm, go ahead, interrupt him. We used to sing it this way, pass me not, O oh, gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. 